Today, we'll discuss the tragic story of Elizabeth Nicole Forshi. Elizabeth's disappearance turned into an investigation that lasted almost 20 years. There were a lot of elements in this story, love, wedding, betrayal, and revealed secrets that led to irreversible consequences. Elizabeth was born on May 13, 1978. She lived in Truckee, California, with her parents and younger brother. When she was 13 years old, a man named Michael Cyperda and his wife Sally moved into the house across the street from them. The Cyperda family had two young children, and they had difficulties adjusting to parental life. Michael worked hard and wanted his wife to return to work, too. After a while, the couple decided they might need help with childcare. Michael offered a neighbor's daughter as a babysitter, and his wife Sally agreed. Thus, 14-year-old Elizabeth became the babysitter for the neighbor's kids. The more time Elizabeth spent with the children, the more attached she became to them. Michael and Sally's children also loved spending time with her. When Elizabeth was 15 years old, a tragedy struck her life. Her father died. According to Donna Forshi, her mother, this event had an enormous impact on Elizabeth. She became more emotional, vulnerable, and sensitive starting to respect and attach herself more and more to Michael Cyperda. She believed that he was an exemplary father. According to Elizabeth, he loved his children unconditionally and supported them in all their hobbies. He was a role model. She previously used to look after Michael and Sally's children only during the day, but now she began staying in their house until late at night. It lasted about two years until one day, Michael decided to move with his family to Iowa to be closer to his relatives. He asked Elizabeth to go with them as a nanny. Elizabeth's mother, Donna Forshi, was against the move and tried to dissuade her daughter from going, even calling Child Protection Services, but to no avail. Elizabeth had her own plans. She became too attached to Michael, Sally, and their two children. Although she was still in high school then, she did not change her mind and moved with Saperda's family to Winfield, Iowa. After the move, Elizabeth's mother, Donna, and best friend, Shannon Gerber, kept in touch with her as often as they could, usually talking to her once a week on the phone or by sending letters by mail. In Iowa, Elizabeth graduated from high school in May 1997. Donna attended the ceremony and gave her daughter an emerald and diamond ring as a graduation gift. Elizabeth cherished that ring. Meanwhile, Michael divorced his then-wife, Sally Krill, and started a romantic relationship with Elizabeth. After the divorce, Sally left the children with Michael and Elizabeth and moved to another place. She kept in touch with her children but stopped almost all contact with her ex-husband. She also no longer spoke to Elizabeth. Cyperda, who was about 40 years old then, immediately showed his dominant nature. He was telling Elizabeth what she could and couldn't do. He told her who she could talk to and who she couldn't. He tried to control all aspects of her life. Their relationship seemed strange from the very start. As a result, Elizabeth's mother and best friend Shannon started noticing that it was becoming increasingly difficult for them to communicate. Michael didn't like it when she talked to them and often got angry if she did. Therefore, Elizabeth started calling her mother and friend only when Michael was not home. Around the same time, Elizabeth became friends with Harper Tracy through their church. During their friendship, Tracy noticed injuries to Elizabeth on five or six occasions. Those injuries included finger marks on Elizabeth's neck and bruising on her abdomen. Tracy's daughter, Sadie, knew Michael's children through church and would sometimes play at their house in Winfield. When she was about seven, Sadie remembers visiting the Cyperda children and seeing Michael shove Elizabeth down a flight of stairs onto her knees. Tracy also recalled an incident when Elizabeth came to her trailer frantic and scared after fleeing a violent altercation at Michael's house. Elizabeth confided she was afraid of Michael and couldn't take any more of the abuse. Tracy noticed Elizabeth's abdomen was very bruised and she had marks on her arms. Elizabeth stayed with Tracy in her trailer for a month. During that month, Michael appeared near the trailer almost daily to use intimidation tactics. He would park his truck on the street, 10 feet from the trailer, and tease Elizabeth. In particular, he threatened her in the following way. 
He told her that he would keep her away from children. He said he would get rid of her and no one would find her. He left threatening notes on the doorstep and a torn cat collar with a note saying she would disappear, just like the cat if she didn't come back. He threatened to hurt the animals and blackmailed her with videotapes and pictures that he had. Tracy saw Michael threaten to take Elizabeth's life and dispose of her body six times. Tracy called law enforcement to stop Michael's behavior. Yet, it was unsuccessful. Undoubtedly, there were red flags everywhere. They all indicated that Michael Seperda was the person people should stay away from. But Elizabeth was too young and probably hoped Seperda would change his behavior. Yet, 40-year-old people rarely change their behavior and attitude toward others. Eventually, Elizabeth left Tracy's trailer and went to live with Michael. They got married in January 1998. By that time, they were living in Mount Pleasant. Tracy attended the wedding despite trying to dissuade Elizabeth from marrying Michael. Michael then cut off Tracy's contact with Elizabeth. The latter eventually told Tracy not to come to Michael's house anymore because those were Michael's instructions. Tracy was not the only person worried about Elizabeth marrying Michael. Donna did not come to Iowa for her daughter's wedding because she disapproved of the relationship. But Elizabeth did visit California to celebrate her younger brother's high school graduation in June 2000. Michael stayed in Iowa, but that didn't stop him from monitoring Elizabeth's every move. He called nonstop for three days while Elizabeth was staying with her mother. Michael was unhappy because he believed that Donna was putting pressure on Elizabeth and convincing her daughter not to return to Iowa. After each call, Elizabeth looked upset and confused. She thought about leaving her husband, but she wasn't sure. To calm Michael down, Elizabeth decided to leave her mother's house. Instead, she stayed with her childhood friend Shannon Gerber. Shannon has been in touch with Elizabeth since she moved to Iowa. They tried to communicate monthly, secretly making phone calls when Michael wasn't around. However, the fact that Elizabeth moved into her friend's house did not calm him. Now, he was bothering Shannon's house with his calls, and most of them were threatening. Shannon recalled that Michael yelled at Elizabeth and threatened to take her life if she did not return home. He also threatened to take the lives of Elizabeth's mother and brother, as well as Shannon and her young son. Michael called several times an hour, day and night, and eventually, Shannon's husband got tired of it and turned off the phone. You don't have to be a detective to know that this infuriated Michael. Shannon implored Elizabeth not to return to Iowa. I didn't want her to go because I was worried I would never see her again, and I took every back road I could possibly think of to the airport to get her to miss her plane, and her flight was delayed, and she got on the plane. Back in Mount Pleasant, Iowa, Elizabeth took a job at Experian, where she met co-worker Sarah Thomas. They quickly became friends, and Sarah always drove Elizabeth home since she lived on the same street as the Cyperta family. During the trips, they talked a lot, and Elizabeth began to trust Sarah and told her about the challenging relationship with her husband. She was showing the bruises on her body that Michael had left. Elizabeth and Sarah became very close, so close that it became a problem. One day, when Michael was not at home, his two children looked through the keyhole in the bedroom and saw that Sarah and Elizabeth had become intimate. When Elizabeth discovered the children had seen them, she quickly packed up and moved her things to Sarah's apartment. But there were two problems. Elizabeth and Michael were married, and Sarah lived with her girlfriend, Terry Thrasher. Betrayal upset not only Michael Cyperta, but also Terry Thrasher. When Terry returned to the apartment, she found more than 30 messages from Michael on her voicemail. In the first message, Michael begged Elizabeth to come home, but in the following few messages, he got angry and threatened her. When Terry went outside to walk the dog, Michael came over and asked her to call Sarah's work phone and ask Elizabeth to return home. He had a bottle of alcohol in his hand, and his children were following him and crying. Michael explained that his wife had left him, she was not answering his calls, and he did not know what to do. When Elizabeth and Sarah entered the apartment, they saw Michael and Terry waiting for them. Frightened, Elizabeth and Sarah left. Michael shouted at Terry to follow him. They got into the car and gave chase. The two couples met face to face in a nearby parking lot. 
Terry started fighting with Sarah because she felt betrayed. Elizabeth was sitting in the car at the time and was afraid to get out. Cursing and screaming and threatening, Michael approached Elizabeth and dragged her out through the window of the car. During the struggle, Elizabeth suffered a lacerated rib and her shirt got torn. Sarah and Elizabeth fled to a nearby gas station where they reported the assault to the police. The state charged Michael with first-degree burglary and domestic abuse assault. The court approved a no-contact order protecting Elizabeth. Terry packed her things and left, so Elizabeth and Sarah started living together. Michael would sit across the street and yell or call them names. Sarah received numerous phone calls, but nobody would respond when she answered. She reported the calls to the police, who had the phone company put a trap on her line to register who was calling. Between June 26th and July 16th, Michael called Sarah's apartment 162 times. On July 16th, 2000, a month after Michael and Elizabeth broke up, Sarah left for work at 10.30 p.m. When she left, Elizabeth was sleeping on the couch, and their dog was locked in the bathroom so it wouldn't interfere with her sleep. When Sarah returned home at 4 a.m., Elizabeth was gone. The situation was strange. There were no signs of a break-in, and everything was in its place, including Elizabeth's documents. The dog was still locked in the bathroom. Not knowing what to do in this situation, Sarah went to bed. When she woke up, Elizabeth still wasn't home. Elizabeth left without her purse, clothes, and other personal belongings. She didn't leave a note. Sarah reported Elizabeth's disappearance to the police 24 hours after discovering her friend was nowhere to be found. Elizabeth Nicole Forshee Cyperta was 22 years old when she disappeared. The police launched an investigation, and of course, Michael Cyperta was their first suspect. On July 16th, the day Elizabeth disappeared, Michael started phoning the apartment around 3 p.m., logging more than a dozen calls through the evening. He last called at 10.56 p.m., that is, he stopped making calls 26 minutes after Sarah left for work and left Elizabeth alone. On July 17th, Michael was supposed to be at work. His friend, Jared Craybill, agreed to watch Michael's children. Craybill testified he found Michael was pretty intoxicated when he arrived at his house around 5.30 a.m. Crable said Michael told him Elizabeth had stayed overnight and left around 5 a.m. Michael decided not to go to work that morning. Police called Michael the next day, July 18th, to ask if he had heard from Elizabeth. He said he had not. On July 20th, officers came to his house to let him know Elizabeth was missing. Michael said his taking a sick day from work on July 17th the day after Elizabeth disappeared, was a coincidence. Michael also stated that due to their breakup, he hadn't been eating and had been getting cramps. Elizabeth seemed to disappear into thin air. She didn't contact her family or friends. Her bank account was untouched, and she had not even received her salary for the last month. The investigators knew that Elizabeth could not just leave without documents and money. All the friends she could have stayed with knew nothing about her whereabouts. The police interviewed residents and distributed flyers with an image and description of Elizabeth, but none of these actions gave the desired result. In early September 2000, Larry Headland, who was then an agent with the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation, interviewed Michael. The latter told the agent he and Elizabeth got along fine and denied any abuse in their relationship. When asked about his June 16th assault on Elizabeth, Michael said basically that it was out of character for him and that he mixed alcohol with his emotions and he shouldn't have done that. Similarly, Michael initially denied making harassing phone calls to Sarah's apartment, but when confronted with phone records, Michael took responsibility for the calls. When the agent pointed out that Michael's calls to the apartment stopped on the night Elizabeth turned up missing, Michael got teary-eyed and said that his situation was not looking good. In addition, Michael said that he was just trying to keep himself out of jail and he didn't want to be accused or held accountable for it. That's how he justified his lies about the phone calls. Michael disagreed with Hedlund's assumptions that Elizabeth was dead and stated that he had never beaten her. After that interview, the police obtained a warrant to search Michael's home. In Michael's bedroom, police found an unlocked safe. 
either inside or on top of the safe, an officer located a gold 2000 pendant that Michael had given Elizabeth and the V-shaped emerald and diamond ring she received from her mother as a graduation gift. Elizabeth only took off her ring when taking a shower or a bath. In all other cases, it was always on her finger. In the photos from the police station taken after Michael attacked her, this ring was on her finger. She hadn't been at Michael's home since then. But how did this ring end up in Michael's safe? The police asked him to explain it. Michael said she must have left it behind when she moved out. When Officer Murray explained he knew from a police photograph that Elizabeth was wearing the ring during the June 16th assault, Michael could not explain how it ended up in his bedroom. Another suspicious thing was that Michael stopped calling Elizabeth the same day she disappeared, although the police informed him about it only four days later, on July 20th. Cyperda was hiding something, but the police needed irrefutable evidence to bring any charges against him. But there were none. Too little time had passed, and there was still a possibility that Elizabeth was hiding of her own free will. But her family did not believe in this version. The case went quiet for many years, but Donna Forshi did not lose hope that her daughter would one day be able to return home. Once a year, she visited Iowa, where Elizabeth lived, and held pickets to raise awareness about her missing daughter. In 2010, Donna paid for the rental of a billboard that featured an image of Elizabeth and a request for any information. The reward was $20,000. Donna said she suspects her daughter may have died tragically, but she hopes they will eventually find her. Someone back there knows what happened to her, and I hope that our presence would spark a recollection, she said. Ten years after her daughter disappeared, Donna Forshi had her own theories about what could have happened. In an interview, she said, my assumption is that he called her and enticed her somehow to come out of the apartment and meet him. Then, they got into a fight and something happened during that night. Despite all the efforts of the police and the family, Elizabeth's fate remained unknown. Since her disappearance in 2000, investigators searched 79 different locations but never found Elizabeth's body. They entered Elizabeth's information in the National Crime Information Center Missing Persons Database. 17 years after her disappearance in 2017, the investigation began anew. By this time, Michael Cyperda had moved to Colorado. The police reviewed all the evidence. The investigators re-examined all the interrogation protocols and found something they had not previously attached importance to. Jared Craybill, Michael's friend who was supposed to look after his children on July 17, 2000, told the police that he found that Michael was pretty intoxicated when he arrived at Michael's house around 5.30 a.m. According to Krabil's testimony, Michael told him that Elizabeth stayed with him overnight and left around 5 a.m. The police questioned Michael many times, but he never mentioned that Elizabeth had spent the night at his house. Moreover, Elizabeth's jewelry somehow ended up in Cyperda's safe. Thus, the authorities decided it was time to arrest him. Although Elizabeth was still missing, investigators believed that she was dead and her husband was responsible for it. In all these 17 years since her disappearance, she has not made a single attempt to contact her family or friends. Michael had repeatedly beaten her, and many of Elizabeth's acquaintances knew about it. Michael threatened to take her life more than once. He said no one would find her. And it seems that he managed to carry out this insidious plan. In November 2017, Michael Cyperda was arrested in Colorado and taken to Iowa, where they charged him with the first-degree life deprivation of his wife, Elizabeth. This is the best news we've had in 17 years. It's been a long time waiting for it and we're very happy that he's in custody, Donna Forshi said. He waived his right to a jury trial. Cases in which crucial physical evidence, such as the victim's body, is missing create additional difficulties for prosecutors trying to establish guilt. For example, without a body, the medical examiner cannot testify about what caused a person's death, and the jury cannot see the victim's injuries or photos from the crime scene. The defense argued that the prosecution's plan was not to reveal the truth, but to find Michael guilty by searching for inconsistencies in witness statements, even though the trial started 18 years later. 
At oral argument, the defense counsel acknowledged that recovering a dead body is not a necessary condition for establishing life deprivation. However, Michael continued to challenge the state's evidence that Elizabeth was dead. The district court found the state proved her death beyond a reasonable doubt. The court reasoned, any argument that Elizabeth is just waiting to be found or may come walking through the door at any moment or may make a call to her mother at any moment is little more than fantasy. The state offered evidence Michael was the last person to talk to her. He admitted their last conversation was at 10.56 p.m. on July 16th. The district court also credited Crable's word that Michael told him Elizabeth spent that night at Michael's house. Adding to these dubious circumstances, Michael unexpectedly missed work on July 17th, and Michael's calls to the apartment never resumed, though police did not officially inform him that Elizabeth was missing until July 20th. Here, the state offered sufficient evidence that Michael's malice toward Elizabeth resulted in the homicidal act. Because Michael was possessive and controlling of Elizabeth, it was more likely he acted with a fixed purpose to do her physical harm when she left him for another intimate partner. Evidence of an acrimonious relationship is highly relevant to the issue of malice aforethought. The state offered proof Michael repeatedly threatened to kill Elizabeth and to dispose of her body so no one would find her. The trier of fact could infer from those persistent threats that Michael put some thought into the act of killing Elizabeth. The court also heard evidence Elizabeth opened a checking account in her maiden name nine days before her disappearance, but never cashed her last paycheck from Experian. The district court also decided the state proved beyond a reasonable doubt that Michael committed an act that caused Elizabeth's death. The court reached that decision after taking meticulous measure of the totality of evidence. Addressing the judge, Michael Forshee, added that it is ironic that it was 25 years ago to the day on August 23rd, the day of sentencing, that their father died from cancer. While their father was taken from the family because of disease, his sister was taken by an avoidable crime, Michael Forshee said. Our lives have been forever darkened because of Mike Cyperta's actions on July 17, 2000, he said. During the sentencing hearing, Donna Forshee pleaded with Cyperta to tell them where her daughter's body was, saying that if he had an ounce of decency or compassion, he would tell them where she was. I hope he lives in misery and pain for the rest of his life, she said. The worst day of her and her family's life was when Michael Cyperta moved across the street from the Forshees in California, she said. It was then, when her daughter was only 14 years old, that he began grooming her, Donna Forshee said. On June 25, 2018, 58-year-old Michael Cyperta was found guilty of first-degree life deprivation. On August 23, 2018, the court sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He also had to pay $150,000 in compensation for Elizabeth's death. But this is not the end of the story. In September 2020, the Iowa Court of Appeals overturned the conviction for first-degree life deprivation, ruling that it was a second-degree crime. In her 30-page ruling on the appeal, Iowa Court of Appeals Judge Mary Tabor wrote, she did not dispute there was sufficient evidence to prove Elizabeth Cyperta's death, nor that there was sufficient evidence to prove Michael Cyperta was the one responsible. Rather, the state, which made its case without a body, weapon, or crime scene, failed to prove Michael Cyperta intended to kill Elizabeth Cyperta when the act was committed. They failed to show intent on first-degree murder because there was no intent, Michael Cyperta said. I ask that if I am not set free, that I at least receive a new trial with a jury. As a result, the court sentenced Michael Cyperta to 50 years in prison with the possibility of parole in 30 years.